My special guest today is Alice Gretchen. She is an American television and film actress. She's been on everything from TNT's Major Crimes. She's been on CSI Miami. She's been in films like the Dukes of Hazard movie. And uh, she has a new book out called Wayward, a memoir of spiritual warfare and sexual purity. I saw that she'd been interviewed on Hemant Mehta's Friendly Atheist podcast, and I wanted to have her on our show today. Hi, Alice. Thanks for coming. Hi, Seth. Thank you so much for having me. I'm reading your book. Our stories have a lot in common, because I came out of fundamental Christianity, right? Uh, literal Bible and all that stuff, and we walk some of the same territory. Uh, perhaps most striking to me was this weird balance that you and I have that while we were very critical of the way we were raised, we weren't mad at mom and dad. I mean, does that make sense? Like we were raised yeah. with lies, but we didn't call our parents liars. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would actually. Um, I really appreciate you you uh, jumping right to that angle. Um, I I like to say that I, to me, pe people always like to say that the problem with Christianity or religion in general is the people. Um, and for me, it's like, no, the people in my life, many of them were very loving. It's the theology itself, uh, the, the doctrine itself that um, that I found personally problematic. And my parents, I don't think were uh, liars. I think that they they were everything that they did and said they did from such a genuine place. There was no deceit. To me, lying implies deceit, and I don't see them as deceitful people. And when you get frustrated, though, I mean, you go back and oh, you yeah. try to have the conversation about, well, here's where I am, and here's what I think, and here's why we disagree, and here's the evidence, and you get the mannequin stare, the brick wall. I mean, I do. I don't know. Do you experience that frustration? Yes, um, I do. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you'll see, I don't want to spoil anything too much for you, uh, but by, by the end of the book, I make it clear that my parents' own faith evolves quite a bit. So today, when, when I talk with my parents about uh, our Christian past, um, I can do so from a place of uh, a lot I think we both can do so from a place of mutual empathy because they no longer believe quite as dogmatically as they did before themselves. So I no longer get that blank brick wall stare of like, wait, what do you mean you don't believe in God anymore? <laughs> um, and, you know, we've all had had time to adjust to these differences now because I've been an atheist for uh, about 13 years now. I'm going to sort of play with time in this interview. I'm going to start sort okay. of well into the book with an anecdote about when you were in an acting class, given your history, and there's a scene that you're practicing or rehearsing where you kiss a guy. And having been raised in a purity culture, this is like a traumatic moment. Like I got the vibe from that section of the book that you felt like the harlot. Yes. Um, so for those who don't know or who haven't read the book yet, I was raised uh, in evangelical purity culture, which for me meant uh, no, definitely no sex before marriage, but also no dating. Um, courtship was preferable to marriage. And uh, not only was there no sex before marriage, but there was also no handholding, no kissing. I believed that God had called me to be completely faithful in mind body and heart to my future husband, whoever he was. And uh, right after I turned 17 in LA, in this uh, acting class that I was in, my teacher assigned me and one of my classmates the scene from The Glass Menagerie. And I wish I could remember the moment of him presenting it even because I'm, I'm a little surprised at myself that I didn't ask for another scene. Like, why didn't I just ask for another scene instead of the one where I would have to kiss my scene partner? And I honestly can't, rem there's much that I can remember very clearly that allowed me to write the book, but that particular moment I can't remember. And I can only guess that maybe my my reasoning was um, if God's called me to acting, which I believed he had, kissing other actors is going to be a part of the job. So maybe I should just rip the Band-Aid off and get it over with in class instead of on an actual TV or film set where everyone would be watching and it would be uh, a lot more excruciating than it was. It was still excruciating, though, um, because we in rehearsals, we never kissed in our own private meetup rehearsals. But when the time came for us to officially perform our scene in front of the class, 
uh, we really were going to kiss. And I remember the moment of the kiss very clearly. Um, and I remember just feeling like sick to my stomach with dread as it was approaching and we were saying our lines and he was moving closer and closer to me and uh, every instinct in my body was just wanting to pull away from him and uh, wondering like, what what the hell did I agree to? Like, uh, oh no, like maybe this was a bad idea. Where's the line between acting and real life? If, if just because I'm playing a character doesn't mean it's not my body actually kissing or touching this other man's body. Um, and so I kind of had this little freak out last minute, which fortunately served the scene because um, the character of Laura in The Glass Menagerie is supposed to be really shy and awkward. And maybe it was her first kiss, first kiss as well. So I got lucky in that sense that at least I didn't have to pretend to be a very sexually experienced wanton woman for my first acting kiss. Um, but yeah, when it happened, uh, I remember being surprised by like the warmth of his lips, like lips wouldn't be warm. I don't know what I was expecting, <laughs> but I'd never kissed a guy before. And I remember thinking like, uh, like keeping my mouth pretty shut. So maybe I could later say, well, it's not like it was an open mouth kiss. You know, my first French kiss is still waiting for my future husband. Like there were all these, all these ways that I rationalized uh, what I was, what I was doing. And afterward, I just felt so disappointed in myself. Um, I felt completely repulsed by my scene partner, which wasn't fair to him because he did nothing wrong. But what he symbolized to me was my own betrayal to my future spouse and my betrayal to God. Modeling acting seems an odd profession for somebody who was raised in a culture where you're taught to sort of be ashamed of your body. Not ashamed. Well, yeah, okay. Ashamed of your body. Uh, would you? Is that the word? How would you phrase the culture of fundamentalism when it came to women? You know, it's, I, I think that shame is the result that we can all identify with. But I think that I know for myself, I was taught that God does not want us to feel shame. Um, but simultaneously with that teaching was so cover up so you don't feel shame. If you're obedient to God, then you won't feel negative things, basically. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I was raised in a culture where they used to teach us that you know, sex is a carnal, lustful, sinful, dirty, 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 dirty thing. And you should only do it with the person that you are married to for the rest of your life under, you know, a consecration of God or whatever, you know, it's just weird <laughs> hypocrisy, this convergence of, of conflicting ideas. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. God made it. It's dirty. You know, mm -hmm. don't do it. Don't mm -hmm. talk about it. Certainly not in uh, polite society. It's, it's a repressive culture. I was talking to Dr. Daryl Ray, the author of Sex and God, about how, you know, when does puberty happen? Let's call it, you know, 12. All right. Well, we'll just average the age out. Sure. Right? But yet the median age of people who get married is actually going up. It's between 25 and 30, which leaves a full decade where you are looking at about innate natural sexual desire, sexual identity, but you're totally set up to feel like you failed, you're an adulterer, you're not even supposed to have these thoughts. The Bible says that if you've lusted after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. You are literally set up to fail, and you felt that way, right? Very much so. Um, I don't, so the thought that I'm about to share with you, I don't really explore in the book that much, but I was def one, of, one of my greatest frustrations with the teachings of purity culture that no one could answer for me, of course, was uh, if God gave us sexual desires from, let's say, 12 years old, uh, and yet we're not supposed to find fulfillment sexually until we're married, and then we're supposed to find it exclusively through our heterosexual partnered spouse, um, then why why would God give us these urges so young. And in my mind, I rationalized it by saying, well, people married a lot younger in Bible times. You know, Mary was, I, I, I don't think there's a place in, in, the, in the actual NIV Bible where it says exactly how old Mary was when she conceived Jesus. But uh, I was always told, oh, she was about 12 or 13 or 14, because that's the average age girls were back then when, when they married. And so I was like, oh, well, okay, so it, it is on time, like my sexual desires, so I should just be getting married younger, but yet my society says that I, I can't, and so maybe I, I was just very confused by it. And um, it, it, the conflict was, uh, why, 
why did God allow societal standards to change um, to have us marry later? Like why, not that I wanted to get married at 12 or 13 years old, but it was just like, man, why couldn't God have just delayed puberty then if, if he knew that society was going to change and it wasn't going to be okay to get married, uh, in middle school, then why, why didn't, uh, he delay our, our sexual desires until later in life if he knew this was going to happen? If you were raised in that evangelical Christianity, did you hold to the man is the dominant figure thing? I mean, I'm reminded of a part of your book where someone just informed you that God has told me I am to be your husband, like I am your destiny. You're welcome. So I'm thinking, <laughs> what's going on in your skull at that moment? Are you thinking, I'm stuck, I have no choice because he's the man? Was there that kind of model going on? Yes, I would say in short, yes, that's what was going on. I think in the moment when that happened, I, w I was panicking because I knew that my response was not a happy one. And I didn't want him to know that uh, because I didn't want to start my marriage off on the wrong foot with my future husband, knowing that I was anything less than stoked to be marrying him. Uh, hang on, let and me park right there. Al Forgive me, Alice, for the interruption, but I, I want to plant a flag right here. Yeah. So you, your immediate response was, well, I don't want to screw this up if he's going to be my husband. I mean, you'd already in that moment kind of accepted it because the rest of us now, and I'm sure you now 10 years or whatever years later, you're thinking, this sounds like a line. I am your destiny. God has you know, written it in the stars. It sounds like he's playing you. Was he sincere? I think he was. Uh, I never fault people for thinking that he was hiding behind God with his own ulterior motives of wanting to be with me. Okay. We both went to the same youth group. We both grew up in a very similar way. And I think he just genuinely thought he wouldn't have feelings for me unless they were God's will. And uh, I think he just, I never knew how God talked to anyone. He never talked to me. And so I had, I had, I had no reason to question how or why God talked to him because by that point in my life at 17 years old, I just accepted God was never going to speak to me directly, and he was always going to continue speaking to me through other people, and that I would never know exactly how he did speak to other people. So I I did not question it. I instantly just accepted what he was saying as God's honest truth. If you want to know how that story plays out, I'm going to make you read the book. It's called Wayward, A Memoir of Spiritual Warfare and Sexual Purity. Your doubt started early. I mean, you were kind of a sine wave. You know, you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down. I'm committed, I'm doubting, I'm sure, I'm not sure. It must have been tra traumatizing for a young child. Yes, it was. Uh, I've, I've said before that to me, uh, for, for me personally, the, the most difficult part of being raised religiously was the confusion of it all. Um, I was just... I was always a very literal thinker. I saw very early on the con many contradictions in the Bible, um, and I was deeply troubled that there's this sadistic God that we're told is love, and it there were so many things that did not make sense to me. Like, like God couldn't have thought of a more creative way to save everyone than to send his only son to be tortured, and we're calling that love. Um, things like that deeply perplexed me from a young age. And uh, simultaneously, I was so scared of hell that I would I would get very scared when my mind would start to go down that <laughs> those rabbit trails. And so um, I stayed a believer until I was 21 years old. And the whole time I, I waffled back and forth between um, between genuine faith even though God was not real to me experientially, I still very much believed he was real. And it's a confusing thing I found to try to explain. It's a friend once asked me, like, but God, you never really believed in it, right? Because it wasn't real to you. And it's like, no, I, I had no alternative of belief. Like, I completely believed in him and he wasn't real to me at the same time. Um, and that's probably indicative of what you're referring to, of, of just this vacillating always um, – well, yeah. you're charged to sort of carry the family mantle, your religious mantle you talked about, sort of this. We talk on the show a lot about the militarization of faith, 
I mean, the Bible talks about the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and, and the sword of the Spirit. I mean, we are trained that we're going to go out and do battle with the world as crusaders and God's army. And you mentioned mm -hmm. in the book there was much of that in regard to you, even by the age of seven. Yes, uh, definitely by the age of seven. I was around kindergarten age uh, when I, when my children's ministry teacher introduced us to spiritual warfare with that story from Ephesians of putting on the armor of God and being in the Lord's army. Um, and basically how I internalized that was, that meant that I always had to be on God's side in the ultimate cosmic battle between good and evil. If I wanted to avoid being cast into the lake of fire on judgment day, I had to always be wary of anything of demonic influence, anything, any sin that might give Satan a foothold and always stay on God's side. Talking here with actor and author Alice Gretchen. This is the part of the interview I perhaps most look forward doing, where we talk about the scam evangelist Rodney Howard Brown. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Rodney Howard Brown, he was big in the 90s. I was in Christian radio at the time, and there was a phenomenon called the Toronto Blessing. And it's because this was, I believe, first seen in a church, a Pentecostal church in Toronto, where people would manifest the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't just that they were speaking in other tongues. They were doing other really crazy shit. <gasps> And? Oh, just, just a, 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 a God used it, and now I want another dream. I'll just start with the first time I saw the symptoms of the Toronto blessing when it uh, spread across the world and eventually hit my small little church fellowship in Rockford, Illinois. I was about eight years old, and I remember being in standing in the with the congregation during praise and worship, and all of a sudden the adults around me started to twitch and like con convulse and like groan and grunt as though someone were like punching their bodies and they were doubling over and then they would wail and cry out and shake. And I looked over and my dad was crying and these men were laying their hands on him. And my mom was non-responsive. She was just like twitching and having like a seizure, which as a kid, it's terrifying to watch your parents losing not only like their minds sort of, but their their physical control over themselves. And I remember me and my four younger siblings just kind of watching terrified. And it looked like all of the grownups in the auditorium were just experiencing an invisible earthquake. And we kids were just like, what the, what is going on? So that was my first introduction to the Toronto blessing and to what I came to know were, what I came to know as the symptoms of being slain by the spirit. The adults started falling over, um, just like falling to the ground without any any reflex of like putting their arms out to catch themselves. They just went down. What's happening here is very holy. What's happening is very real. Rodney Howard Brown. Uh, my parents took me to see him when I was about 10. Uh, and he, I write in the book that um, God never slayed me with the spirit at any conference, but at Rodney Howard Brown's conference, I was sure that God would because he was this famous evangelist, um, especially known for being able to like slay people pretty quickly and with holy laughter, which is like, a, I describe it as a spirit led fit of the giggles, uh, like a mass hysteria giggle fit that we're told is the Holy Spirit and God's sense of humor. So. It was really funny to me watching all of the adults laugh and fall out of their chairs, and I believed it was God. And um, I, when I went up to get uh, to receive prayer from Rodney Howard Brown, um, I kept waiting for the Holy Spirit, and His hand was on my forehead, and He was praying, and I was just taking so long to fall over. And I was thinking, like, man, why aren't I falling over? Like, surely, if God was going to slay me through anybody, it would be this guy because you know He's like super powerful and blessed. He's such an open channel of God's Spirit, and nothing happened. And eventually, uh, His hand was getting heavier and heavier on my head. I was standing on stairs, so I moved down a step to try to relieve the pressure. 
and he um, pushed me down. Uh, and it really hurt. It hurt my neck and it was very forceful. And I remember just looking up at him and him kind of looking down at me. And the message that I internalized was this look that was just like, make me look good. Like, don't expose that I'm the one who pushed you over. And I complied. I need to issue this warning. You have to be very careful what you say about the move of God. Because you see, Jesus said that which is said against me will be forgiven. That which is said against my father will be forgiven. But that which is said against the Holy Ghost will never be forgiven. Not in this life or in the life to come. Because I was little, like I was just used to just, I was not a rebellious kid. I was used to just complying to what adults told me to do, implicitly or explicitly. And uh, that was Rodney Howard Brown. Um my experience with him. And I found out much later, years later, that I was not the only person that he physically forced to mimic symptoms of God's touch because they weren't actually feeling God's touch. Yeah, he's straight up sociopath, in my opinion. We saw him down in Florida during COVID, where he was uh, inviting people to come into his congregation. He had, I guess, machines that he said were blessed and were uh, taking COVID out of the air so they'd be perfectly safe. And I think he ended up being prosecuted by the state of Florida. I think he was fined and perhaps even jailed for making these claims. And of course, he cried persecution. But his, you know, he has been kind of a scammer since day one. I was reading Wayward and I was struck by how often I have conversations with people who came out of the same culture that you did, women who have been shamed for their own sexuality, trained to feel constant guilt for being a woman. And I thought, I would like to give a copy of your book to them. Uh, like I, this, It's a very raw, very transparent, very open journey through where you were, what you thought, and ultimately how you got out. I also thought I would like to give this to men to help them understand the sexual shame that women in fundamentalism go through that's imposed on them by their cultures. I bring this up because you're transparent about it in your book. Uh, you decide how much you want to talk about here. You felt guilty for your period. I did. To me, my period symbolized um, the the mantle, the the burden that I now had to carry, which was to be responsible for the lust of men. Uh, many people have spoken publicly before about how purity culture is rape culture. It's victim blaming, uh, and I it's hard for me to disagree with that. Um, the Bible, all throughout, what screamed at me the most when I read it cover to cover when I was twelve was how sexist God is. How uh, how how less worthy he deems females than males and uh, how much responsibility we females have to constantly be the gatekeepers of sexual purity. Um, there's, there's plenty of verses telling men not to lust, like the one you referenced earlier, you know, don't even looking at a woman lustfully is committing adultery and better to chop off your hand than to, than to allow your hand to cause you to sin. And I think that, that purity culture obviously affects men, but for me, I'm, I'm a woman. I can only speak personally to my own experience. And I felt that it was very clear that being female alone was sinful. Um, being, a uh, being, sorry, if there's, if there's noise, there's, uh, people doing maintenance on, on the rooftop of no my worries. apartment building. No um, but yeah, I felt like being, being female not only immediately made me of lesser value in God's eyes than being male did, but it also, it, even from the story of Eve, the, the, the Bible sets up women as sinful, were the, were the temptation, and um, it's our fault. If they sin with us, it's our fault. And um, there there's so many examples in the Bible of women being punished for men having sex with them, whether the women were consenting or not. Very clearly, God says to stone women for being raped. Um the only exception is uh, if if like she didn't if she was raped in the countryside, 
um, where no one could hear her cries, then it's okay. You can let her live and not stone her um, because no one was there to, to, to run in and help. But if she was raped in a city, she had to be stoned because clearly someone would have heard her. Well, you know, the game for women is rigged from the uh, first chapters of Genesis because the Bible says that one of the curses upon Eve after tempting Adam was sexual desire for Adam. So, even mm -hmm. her model for being attracted to, you know, and loving someone mm -hmm. physically was part of a curse and being blamed for the downfall, essentially, of all humankind. Now, my parents and I never had the sex talk. I'm actually really relieved about this <laughs> because I have no idea how that would have gone down. You know, I have no idea what that would have even looked like. I feel like I, I, I escaped. But you did have the sex talk with a fundamentalist, evangelical, Bible-believing parent. How'd that go? <laughs> so it was a friend of mine who first told me what sex was. She, she was like, it's when a man puts his penis in a woman's vagina. And I was just thoroughly aghast. And I was like, there's no way my parents would ever do something so inappropriate to each other. Because she told me it's how babies are made. You can't make a baby without having sex. And I was there. I just didn't believe her. And so I confronted my mom about it. And she her face just blanked. I was about 10 years old at this point. I don't think my mom thought the sex talk if we were going to have one was going to come until probably a couple years later. So I think she was completely taken aback. And I just remember my mom's not one to be at a loss for words that often. And she was at a loss for words. <laughs> and because uh, I asked her basically, like, this is what my friend said. Is this true? And she said, your, your friend shouldn't have said that. But yes, it's true. And then I was at a loss for words because it's my parents told me that my private parts were, were private. You should never let anyone look at them or touch them. And I understand, of course, now they were trying to protect me, you know, like it'd be weird if I let someone do that when I was a little kid. So but what I internalized then was like, oh, it's because they're shameful. They're they're dirty. Uh, and the thought that my parents would do that to each other and that other parents were doing that to each other was just a lot for my little mind to take in. And I just was just thoroughly repulsed at the idea of sex. I was like, well, I'm never going to have sex. I'm never going to do something that gross. Like people pee out of there. Like there's no way I'm touching that. Like <laughs> so and then puberty hit. And the hormones started going. I'm like, oh, yes, sex sounds like a great idea. And I, I guess from puberty on, I had what, what what I would now describe maybe as like just a strong sex drive. And I think a lot of young girls and boys do have one. I think we give more attention to the male sex drive. Um, certainly in the churches that I grew up in, we there was all this talk about how men struggled to control their bodily impulses and desires. No one really talked about women struggle, struggling with their own physical desires. Um, um, it was always from the gatekeeper standpoint, it's like, it's almost like women had no sexual desires. We were just constantly to keep the men at bay with theirs. And that made me feel really, uh, really bad about myself because I had sexual desires and, and you're right. I'm very candid and transparent about it in, in the book because I feel, I feel like a lot of, a lot of women and girls are going to relate to that. Um, yeah, I well, thought to be clear, I'm not trying to peer in your windows here as we talk. I mean, I'm, I'm only bringing this up because, it, I mean, you've got essentially a book that deals strongly with how religion inhibits sexuality and mm -hmm. how you were liberated from that. So I want everybody to, to know I, I have a reason for the questions. The, by the way, I will never <laughs> forgive you for the mental image of my parents doing each other. Like, no, <laughs> no. Uh, there's no room in my brain for my mother and father <laughs> doing each other. Okay, we can't. We can't um, Fair enough. How did you get out? I mean, you don't have to, you know, read the book to me, but how did at least the beginning seeds of change begin to take root? The beginning, the beginning seed, I would say that was the the, the first major domino that fell was uh, when the guy, my guy friend from my youth group, announced that God had shown me I was his future wife. To me, that was the first huge uh, chink in my the armor of my faith because 
it's like, this isn't how it was supposed to happen. God was supposed to reward me with a future husband and a love story that fulfilled and was far beyond anything that my own romantic desires could have come up with. And I didn't, I wasn't attracted to this guy. I loved him, but as a friend, and it just felt like such a betrayal um, from God. Uh, him too, but I, I didn't even fault him then, nor do I now, to the extent that I faulted and continue to fault the promise that I fell for, um, which was that if I'm faithful, God's going to bless me and my marriage with all of these wonderful, wonderful things. And the fact that that didn't happen for me was the first time I was like, whoa, there's some flaws in the teachings that I was taught. This is not how it's supposed to go. And then from there, it was a slow unraveling of like, well, what else isn't true that I believed? What else was I taught that is just a betrayal in the waiting for me? Um, and I I was what, what I now know to be a, a progressive Christian for the three years following that, that, that uh, that really affected my relationship with God, that exper- that betrothal, I would call it a betrothal. And I was still too scared of hell to even imagine ever leaving my faith completely. But I did need to find God on my own terms and reestablish um, an idea of him that I could get behind. That was not a traitorous God, but I, it, it, w- it was really tough. I think a lot of us who have gone through that deconversion can relate to just how mentally tough it is to reconcile um, your desire for God to still be true. <laughs> but You start creating a, a religion in your own image at some point, right, due to your yes. own moral compass. You take this verse, which doesn't make any moral or historical sense, so you just put it aside, and then there's another section or a story or hey, wait, maybe this is metaphor. I don't know what the metaphor could possibly be, but I know it's not literal. And and you start to you stair step out. I mean, you've experienced that. It's it's interesting, though, that because I find a lot of people end up in that sort of deistic place. Well, I know there's something out there. I think mm-hmm. there's a God. Mm-hmm. And most people never take the next steps because the next steps are often the scariest. What if? Mm-hmm. What if there is no cosmic designer, father figure? What if everything's not part of a master plan? Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in you on that last couple of steps there. I mean, did you hang out there for a while? I mean, what caused you to take the next steps? I did hang out there for a while. Um, I, what caused me to take the next, next steps were prompted by, uh, a question from an ex-boyfriend at the time, I, I realized that I no longer wanted to be associated with the Christianity of my youth. And so I started calling myself a follower of Christ. Um, and my, my boyfriend at the time had described me as Christian. And I corrected him. And I said, you know, I'm, I actually don't like calling myself a Christian anymore. Uh, I, don't, I don't like uh, what it means to me and the people that I see using it. I don't want to be associated with that. And he's like, oh, okay, well, you're not a Christian anymore, but do you still, and he, and he asked sort of offhandedly, um, he, he, it came out like, why do you still believe in God? Because I told him, I was like, I still believe in God, but, you know, just not that God. And he's like, well, why do you still believe in God, like, at all? And I just was blanked. My mind just completely blanked. And I thought, like, oh, I'm, I, it's just because I feel put on the spot. But no, his question just haunted me for weeks afterward. And um, I would say that that's, I couldn't shake it. And simultaneously, we, around that same time, we started watching this documentary called Jesus Camp. And uh, it shows a children's pastor teaching these kids how to essentially like pray in tongues. And I could not handle watching even 10 minutes of this film. I started shaking and I was so angry and I didn't understand my emotional reaction. Now I would say I was really triggered. Um, It brought me back to a place of my own faking praying in tongues and always feeling like there was something wrong with me. And it made me feel so much shame and anger at the God that I believed in who I finally was realizing and forcing myself to acknowledge had never actually been real back to me. Like I I believed in God, but he'd never been real to me. He never let me experience him, even though I was a very devout Christian, uh, as many of us deconverts were. um, I, I, I don't think there's anything more I could have done to be a a good God fearing Christian. And acknowledging that seeing seeing my childhood outside of myself 
in that documentary, Jesus Camp, really forced me to reckon with, wow, that God was never real to me. And I just couldn't shake it. I just couldn't shake it. I wanted to. I wanted to ignore it. And I wanted to look at my doubts as an attack from Satan. I wanted. I was justifying all the feelings and thoughts I was having, but they just would not go away. And I, eventually, I just, I needed to know once and for all, um, if God was real. And uh, I didn't want to, to know in many ways. I, I would have much rather um, continuing on with my little uh, God made in my image, as you put it. I would have much rather continued on with my progressive, non-Christian Christianity than force myself to have a reckoning with, is there anything out there? Not just the Christian God, but any God. Is there any deity? Is there any being of love that gives a shit about me, uh, that cares if I believe in them or not? <laughs> I see a lot of us who are ex-believers as, I mean, activists to ex-believers, as kind of ambassadors. I'm not trying to paint a, you know, a too generous portrait of us as activists, <laughs> but I, we come out and we start to see what we were through glass. You can be more objective, right? With distance. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I am desperate to try to make sure that fewer people go through this, that, mm -hmm. you know, the next Seth Andrews, right? The next Alice Gretchen, who's right now seven years old and they're banging a Bible over their head and they're threatening them with hell and they're causing them to be ashamed about everything. They, I mean, if you think about fundamentalist religion, certainly our fundamentalist Christianity, it really is a denial culture, right? Mm -hmm. Deny mm -hmm. yourself. The Bible tells us, mm -hmm. deny yourself. But you think about all of the things that are part of our indigenous natural humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's that line in the movie, The Devil's Advocate? You know, God has essentially created us a certain way, but then he set up all the rules in opposition. I mean, we're destined to fail. Yep. And uh, I'm guessing, I mean, forgive the standard book talk question, but that's why you wrote the book, right? You're trying to be sort of an ambassador and, and help other people to escape. Would that be accurate? Yes, that would be accurate. Um, I wrote the book with the intention of help of, um, offering a sense of catharsis and validation to other people going through a similar experience, not just to escape the, the, the daily terror that we all live in, like chronic fear was just ingrained in my veins, um, not just to escape that on top of so many other things that uh, religion contributes to, but also to offer hope that there's like, yeah, I, I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture. It's devastating to lose your faith sometimes. For me, it was. It, I went through a really rough period that I'm very open about um, where I had panic attacks, where I was uh, self-harming. And I don't, I don't want to say that escaping is the hardest thing you're going to do. For me, it wasn't. It was, what do I fill this void with? How do I cope? How do I even look at reality? And I wanted to show in the book how I got through that. Um, there's so much more in later chapters that I could have added, um, and maybe it'll be another book, I don't know, but just sort of about my how I put myself back together more. Um, I didn't want to just encourage people um, to know that it's okay to leave. I also wanted to show there's so much freedom on the other side. There's so much love in the secular world. It's nothing to be scared of because I was so scared of the world and uh, taught that it was just evil. And um, that's just not what I experienced. I experienced so much more grace in the secular world than I ever did within the confines of Christianity. And I really wanted to show people like the deconversion can be rough, but it gets it can get better. Um, you don't have to live in fear the rest of your life. You don't have to constantly be at war with your intellect because of your faith if you don't want to be. Um, and I think it's hard for people to, to go through the process of deconverting when they don't see what looks to be like a pleasant or friendly alternative. I know for myself, I was very scared of the word atheist. I was scared of atheists. Um, I was scared of the word secular. I didn't even listen to secular music growing up. Uh, and I just never really saw or I, I didn't even care to self-expose myself to to secular goodness because part of it was out of my control. It's because I was indoctrinated. But also, I, I don't know. I was so scared of my own curiosity. And I hope what people take from the book, those who grew up also believing, um, 
I hope what they take away is not just encouragement to escape something that may no longer feel true to them, but also encouragement that like, you don't have to live with an empty void. I know that faith gives us all uh, often a deep sense of meaning. I have learned how to create my own sense of meaning. Um, and it took me a long time, but I'd never really seen examples of people who had lost their sense of purpose when they lost their faith. I never heard stories like this before. And now there's a huge online community of us ex-believers who have very candidly shared our stories. I lost my faith in around the mid late 2000s and I didn't see that that much. And um, I hope to offer that to other people who grew up similarly. If I can read a couple of sentences from your book, you said, I realized I was free from rules, free from guilt for breaking the rules, free from the agony of never being certain what the rules were. I was free from fear and free from submission, free from worrying whether I was obeying God enough and free from the anxiety of committing sins I wasn't even conscious of. I was free to be myself in whatever ways felt most true. Alice, you've just summed up the feelings of liberation that a great many ex-believers do feel. And I'll put a link to your book in the description box. It is called Wayward, a memoir of spiritual warfare and sexual purity. It's been an honor to have a conversation about this with you. All success with the book, and let's talk again, Thank okay? Thank you. Sounds good, Seth. Thank you so much.